apology because I was meant to be timekeeping, but I was far too engrossed to do that properly. So uh, we've run over. We have got time for uh, a, sh a few, and I mean a really a few very short questions. Uh, and please, can they be questions rather than kind of comments and, and, and kind of um, uh, preaching? So if we just have <laughs> two or three really short questions. And thank you all for listening so much. OK, I'm going to take one, two, three, four, and that's all. If, if, you've, um, if you are the son or daughter or grandchild of somebody who's converted to Judaism, no matter through which other, at what point do you become Jewish by birth? So, Mary converts to Judaism. Is her daughter Jewish by birth now? Um, in the talk about arguing with God, you at the end mentioned said that all these people who, who did it were prophets and not normal people. And then you read a story not from the Bible but from a different text which I can't remember the name of. It, it might be that the definition of these things are different in Judaism, but it seems that the person from that story, at least to me, seemed like, you know, like a prophet. You know, you call out and a heavenly voice answers. That seems quite prophet-like. Um, yeah, it's a lot of very, very weird things happen in the Talmud. Um, I wouldn't take it too literally. Um, yeah, it's uh, the we we had a question on the definition of a prophet before. Do you want to repeat your your definition, if that would help? Uh, well, the the classic definition of a prophet is somebody to whom God talks, who has a mess, who is commanded to give that message to the community, and who conversely also stands and represents the community and argues with God, uh, okay, as Mo Moses did. Uh, but actually, it, I don't think it's confined to prophets. We have Hasidic rabbis arguing with God um, very famously in the. I think 18th century, one of the rabbis, uh, Rabbi Eliezer, no, it wasn't Rabbi Eliezer Lijansk, who was it who put God on trial? Um, one of the Hasidic rabbis decided that God was guilty of not providing for uh, orphans and widows, so he convened a rabbinic court, and that they just shut the door because God is everywhere, so they didn't have to summons him, and they found him guilty. Um, this, they then went off and prayed the afternoon prayer. Uh, so, <laughs> so there were no um, practical consequences for God. But I, I think that the concept actually goes beyond prophets. And uh, yeah, people do it. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to. Yeah, yes, uh, I, can I come back to what you interesting thing you were saying about the, the, the um, Jew who converted to Catholicism and became a monk? And you said he was allowed to settle in Israel, but not under the, the law of return. What, or what, or what, what would therefore be the definition of uh, of those who are entitled to have the automatic law of return? What does the Israeli state say about how would they define it? Fortunately or possibly more likely, unfortunately, the Orthodox have the last say in Israel on matters of Jewish law. So Israel applies an Orthodox definition of Jewish identity, i.e. matrilineally descended or converted by approved uh, converts. And there have been controversies recently about uh, co uh, converts made by the reform movement, whether or not they qualify. So it's, again, it's a heavily politicized issue, very much to do with the power of the largely ultra rather than orthodox, just orthodox uh, political parties in Israel. But uh, there was a certain gut feeling about that one, I think, because they actually overrode the orthodox, all of whom would have said, well, he's Jewish, he's Jewish. And the, the, it was the secular side who said, no, not, not accepting him. It's, he's already plumped for another religion. That's not somebody Jewish. So you've got this, uh, again, contradictory thing of the influence of the ultra-Orthodox political force, which tends to use ultra-Orthodox definitions of identity, and a reaction from the secular branch that actually negates that. So that's also up for grabs to a certain extent. Um, yeah, it's just briefly worth mentioning um, there's a difference between uh, the law, uh, 
of Israel in terms of uh, if someone's Jewish enough to make Aliyah, which means to go and live in Israel for the rest of their life, uh, because it is your right to do that as a Jew, which is to say you have one Jewish grandparent, um, or, or whether the uh, the Israeli Rabbanut, the, the rabbi in it in Israel, will recognize you for the purposes of uh, marriage and burial and so on as a Jew. So a lot of the people who are allowed to move to Israel permanently and be considered Jewish enough to do that by the government there, which is secular mostly, um, are then not allowed to uh, get married or be buried within that land uh, because of, of um, this uh, issue we were talking about with the, the Rabbanut. I have a question about the Sabbath. Um, it's a history question, really, so you, I don't know if you'll, if you'll know, but um, do, did the um, Greek or Roman pagans have a Sabbath? And if not, do we have Judaism to thank for for the weekend? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> you do indeed, and the, the, the many of the Roman writers, uh, Catholic, uh, people like uh, Juvenal, wrote, uh, sort of railed against the Jews being lazy because they didn't work one day a week, and they found that quite unbelievable and disgusting and irresponsible. So actually, classical civilization was very against the idea of a Sabbath. And uh, no, it is, it is a Jewish invention, as yep. far as I know. <laughs> We've had one brilliant question from the back that um, we shouldn't include, but I'd love to include it, which is, what can we as Christians learn from the Jewish community and perhaps one of our own? How can we support you best at the moment? Maybe just one line from each of you to round up today's brilliant and informative session. I've just learned that I have rights to go and live in Israel. So I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> what we can learn from each other, I think, is to listen to each other's stories and, and, and listen to them with real compassion and understand how deeply heartfelt they are. Rachel. Um, how we can learn from each other and support each other, I think, for me, is a lot about which narratives, uh, what I said before when I was talking about which stories we've been given to eat and which ones we choose to eat, both in terms of the stories that we share in our sacred texts and reassessing who gets to be the protagonists in those stories and which stories we might have glossed over um, that are sitting right in the middle of those stories. And similarly, the stories that we tell about each other um, to remove the, the uh, homogenous blob <laughs> that Lindsay spoke about, I guess, can only happen one by one by actually having a, a deep, good listening conversation, which might um, probably be done over some food, maybe someone's Shabbat table, probably. <laughs> it's very tasty. Um, I'm going to just offer a couple of specific things what, uh, for, for, for learning from. Um, I think from my context with Christian special uh, scriptural reasoning, I realize that there uh, the, the vast and enormous and diverse tradition of Christian commentary through the ages uh, has receded for many Christians a bit more into the background than the equivalent of the Jewish world has for Jews who are interested. And I, I would offer a return to that, you know, come and learn with us and you'll be able to go back to your own text and go, oh, we've got this too. Yeah, we've got this method. And um, I think that's maybe something we could offer is that particular form of text study using the wisdom of the ages, uh, not to be a slave to it, but to, to use it as an inspiration. And I'd, I'd like to think that maybe we, that's something we could offer for you. I think there, there are things we can take back from the Christian community. And many parts of the Jewish community, notably the Orthodox, could do with a lot more social action. Uh, we're getting there very slowly. Uh, the, the Reform and Masority movements are way, way ahead of the Orthodox ones. But the Orthodox really need to get their nose above the ghetto wall and say, what else can we do for the world? So I think the learning process is two-way. Uh, for support, listening to each other, learning about each other, discussion, talk and in a safe space. Um, many, many Jews are still very, very frightened of being evangelized. And uh, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but that really is a terrible fear. And I know many, many Jews who will not step foot in a church, don't want to talk to Christians because they feel they're going to be got at. Uh, and if you can make Jews feel safe about that, um, dialogue will be much, much easier and more productive. Uh, yeah, Lindsay stole my point. Um, <laughs> okay, my my other point is um, on a uh, yeah quite a serious note. Um, something really quite specific um, that I'd like people to understand better about, I guess, the Jewish experience is that um, 
I think a lot of non-Jews, uh, they notice Jews having um, a lot of like views or concern or whatever about Israel-Palestine um, and anti-Semitism. And they look at these individuals and they feel, well, they're secure, they have um, citizenship, they are relatively affluent. Why, why are they behaving like that? Um, and they don't understand it. And uh, I would really appreciate um, more understanding of that in the context of a history of uh, many, many centuries of persecution and insecurity and moving around and being moved on, culminating in the Holocaust. And we're living in, you know, only a few generations after that. And we're such a small minority uh, worldwide. And, um, you know, what might look s safe and secure uh, temp is, you know, really quite a temporary thing. And I think um, it'll take a very long time of, um, period of sort of normality and security to make that kind of history go away. Um, and I'd really like other people to kind of understand that more.